Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be talking about seven things exorcists want you to know. Yeah, we're going to get real inside stories from exorcisms, what they know, how they know it, and what they wish you knew so you could protect yourselves from demons. First and foremost, someone that we need to know in this battle is St. Michael the Archangel. May he pray for us. All right, so we're back in the studio today with Father Rich. I'm Ryan Delacross, Ryan Shield. We've got Charles Franny with us. From uh, he's the author of this book called Slaying Dragons. It's really, uh, really going to be an interesting conversation today. Yeah, Slaying Dragons. This book is what exorcists see and what you should know. And uh, in the course of writing this book, you've done a lot of research on exorcists. You've interviewed exorcists, and you've seen their their public works and their writings, and condensed it into a book that people can really use as a guide to understanding uh, the spiritual combat and warfare that we are all under. Right, right. One of the things when I talk about the book to people, they ask, what what can an exorcist tell me that a regular priest can't? I'm like, well, exorcists see behind the veil, essentially. When they're dealing with demons, the demons will talk to them and Oof. tell them things and tell them how powerful holy water is and you know the St. Benedict crucifix and metals and blessed salt and everything and how the demons get in. So their insights are invaluable. You know, I remember being at Ave Maria and first picking up uh, a Father Amorth book, uh, An Exorcist Tells a Story, which was so eye-opening. And I'm wondering, have, have, did you come in contact with his work? Was that one of your uh, one yeah, of so your who points are some of research? Of the who are some of the sources and some of the exorcists that uh, contribute and are referenced in this book? You know, the um, primary one is Father Chad Ripperger, and I was introduced to, he was the first exorcist I was introduced to about about two years ago now when I first started doing this study, and he has so many talks just free online. The request is you do some some penance, or you know, penance where is what he calls it, you pray for him as the, uh, the payment, so to speak. So he was the first one. I studied him for about a year, and then I had already read Father Amorth's book probably like 10 years ago and didn't really know how to process it because I had no concept of all these spiritual warfare uh, principles. So I think it just went in one ear, out the next, and didn't know how to utilize it. But once I got to the second edition, this is the second edition book, uh, I pulled in um, a couple of books from Father Morth. went back to that one. He has, uh, he Exorcist Tells His Stories, and then more stories. And then, uh, I can't remember the other one. That was the primary book I used. I was, uh, I forget the name of it, but he has like three or four or more books. Um, and then, um, yeah, Father Fortea, he's, uh, he has a good book, um, Interview with an Exorcist. There's also a video by the same name. I saw that actually about 10 years ago. And again, didn't really know how to process it until everything just, you had to have, I had to have the right key. Once I had the key, I understood how to make sense of all these teachings. And then Father Gary Thomas, he's another great exorcist, has a lot of videos online. Um, seems to be like Father Ripperture, wanting to be very public. And then um, in my own seminary training, I was in seminary. About ten years ago is when I discerned our Lord was not calling me to the priesthood. But I like, got to know, like like our illustrious Ryan here. Who yeah. was, so you got kicked, you got kicked out? No, no, I freely left. <laughs> uh, See, there's the distinction. <laughs> That's the distinction. Jesus discerned me out. <laughs> <laughs> I got to hear that story. One day. <laughs> Maybe it'll come up. Um, but then I got to know priests all up and down the East Coast, and some of them are involved in exorcism ministry. And so a lot of exorcists are not named in the book because they like to be, some like to be anonymous. We can talk about that once we get to it. But um, so they, you know, I was in seminary, so it was a protracted process of like nine years. So I got a lot of coaching from good priest mentors, and some of them were going to exorcism conferences in Rome and in the States as well. So I was always picking things up. And then when I got around to writing this book, I just had all these people I could talk to and like follow up on and put all these stories in there that I've collected providentially over the years. Awesome. So <laughs> before we crack into the book and talk about the seven things that exorcists want you to know, there's some one thing that we want you to know. And Father? So that's right. You want you to visit catholictalkshow.com. There on that website, you'll be able to see every way that you could listen in or watch. And if you do want to watch on YouTube, if you type in Catholic Talk Show, make sure that you click the subscribe button as well as click the little bell so that whenever we produce a new video, it will produce in your feed. And a big shout out goes to all of our patrons. If you're considering becoming a patron of the show, go to patreon.com 
forward slash Catholic Talk Show. And that's a way that you can financially support us to ensure that we continue to bring great content in our Catholic faith and great people like Charles onto the show. And we thank you so much for your support. And as we jump into this material, I'm very, very interested to, fi- to find out these seven things. Yep. So how do, how do we begin? Where are we going to start? So I think the first and most fundamental thing that any exorcist uh, would want you to know, and this is probably... I was, I'm going to say it's probably even contentious, I mean, even amongst Catholics, but the most important thing is that demons are absolutely real. And to start with, they exist. They have to. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot, you know, in the latter half of the 20th century and here in the early part of the 21st century, there really is a tendency towards the, for the church to move away from the, the reality of demons and Satan himself as actual beings. And, I mean, you've even heard high ranking religious officials, you know, in religious orders say, well, the demons and al- the, the Satan is an allegory or demons really are compunction, not necessarily a f- spiritual reality. But anyone who says that is wrong. Demons are absolutely well, real in scripture. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, it's like <clears throat> pretty obvious uh, that the, the, in scripture that there was encounters between Christ himself and even some of the apostles. Too. Mm-hmm. And I believe scripture, the word, the living word of God helps us to really come to a greater understanding of what we are experience, experiencing on a spiritual level day in and day out. And it helps to shine that light into the invisible world so that we can see more clearly what we are facing. And really, when we take into account what we struggle with, the realities of temptation, the realities of sin, and looking out into the world and seeing the darkness that we wrestle with, You know, by assigning these things to the demonic powers, it helps us to really highlight what we must focus on in the battle and what we must use in the battle to be successful with Christ. Yeah, you know, in this like kind of postmodern, scientifically oriented world, the concept of demons seems absolutely Bronze Age. And it's just like, oh, sure, blame it on demons. But that is a, that's exactly what they want you to think. Uh, Devil doesn't want you to know he's real. That's, that's kind of his game. And, but I think exorcists, they experience this firsthand and the reality of demons is completely clear and inherent to them through the line of their work. And so in your book, what kind of um, experiences would I, would an exorcist have maybe on the first time that they've encountered a demon or how do they really know that demons are real? Well, uh, for exorcists, they, uh, once they're called by their bishop, they are, um, often, and one of the things I talk about is sometimes they don't know what to do because of this widespread disbelief in demons, even among bishops and poor seminary training. They don't know what to do, so they go to experienced exorcists uh, who will take them under their wing. And one of the first things they'll do is um, watch an exorcism, and, and with no, you know, no experience prior to that. And then they see uh, levitations right in front of them. They hear those voices that are not the person's, not the the voice of the possessed, but the voice of the demon. Things flying around the room. Um, contortions, just like, uh, what do they call it? Where the, uh, the face changes to match a certain demon. They all have their own like facial contortion, mm-hmm. but it's, it's so, it's so, it's almost scientific. Like people work in exorcism ministry, exorcists and laymen who help them can really, could really put together a body of like facts. Like this is what happens. This is what happens next. This is what they're doing. This is what you're going to see. If you apply this sacramental, you're going to see this kind of reaction. Though it's not always the same for every demon. That's almost like a medical student interning under a doctor and saying, okay, here we have this, here we have this, this is the symptoms of this. So the young exorcists or exorcists in training experience the same kind of firsthand experience. It's so um, clearly that way. Like one of the things I think... Mm. Maybe have been the same priest mentor in Rome that trained some notable exorcists, but he would, I um, can't remember his name, in the middle of an exorcism, a full, ex- like the demon is manifesting just like is classic. He would stop and take a phone call. The phone would ring. He'd go over and get it and just leave the person like in full manifestation of the demon and then come back just so nonchalant. And uh, some exorcists have witnessed that while being the, the trainee. And like, what is he, what is he doing? Why, why is he so casual about this? I'm just taking a phone call. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) It's the parish back home. I got, I've got, you know, the scheduling app. Yeah, the scheduling app. (laughs) My sister needs her MRI. (laughs) (laughs) And then he starts right back where he left off. So how do they distinguish between, and I would say that most cases that are presented to the church uh, to be considered for 
uh, demonic oppression or or possession would be mental illness. Mm -hmm. So what kind of process do they does the church do and do exorcists do to determine when there is a spiritual element versus a psychological nature of the issue? Yeah, so it seems like I got different statistics from different exorcists, but less than 10%, sometimes less than 5 or even lower are actual cases of possession or extreme obsession or something. So most of them are mental illness. Um, so Father, it- Father Morth, one thing, a priest friend of mine who's an exorcist reminded me of, like Father Morth would just, if he was suspicious, uh, the, oh, right, first, all exorcists have the person go through a psychological evaluation first. That's standard practice for the churches. Yeah. They don't just start, you know, throwing holy water at them. Like, oh, you're, right. it, it really is a very careful and measured approach to uh, assessing a person's uh, mental state before we, the idea of an exorcism ever comes up. It is very careful in that mm-hmm. respect. And then um, Father Morth would, uh, once he was suspicious, he would sometimes just do a major exorcism, not a minor, but the major one. Because if you start doing an exorcism and there's a demon, he shows up. And if there's no one shows up, then it's just mental illness. So that um, not all of them do it that quickly, but as soon as the priest starts to, par- to pray, even a minor exorcism, they can start to discern the presence of the diabolical. So what's the difference between a minor and a major exorcism? You know, that's going to have to be in my next book. Oh. Because I kept hitting that, but then like, you know, there are more pressing things. So I moved on. But my understanding, non-expert mm-hmm. understanding, is that all priests can do minor exorcisms without the permission of their bishop. And it's... I don't yeah. know what the form. We it's, do it's, during, rooted, uh, it's rooted right in the baptismal rite. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's mm-hmm. right. That's and right. then even more specifically in the baptismal rite mm-hmm. of the uh, 62 missile, it's mm-hmm. much more. Uh, because, I mean, if you go over the, the ordination, uh, the, the rite of, you know, uh, becoming an ordained member, what you normally received was like porter. And one of those, uh, one of those allocations, you know, acolyte mm-hmm. um, it was as exor- the office of exorcism. The office of exorcism. So that faculty was received in the process of formation and becoming a priest. And I think what you brought up formation before, it's mm-hmm. important to realize that this may be lacking in respect to seminary formation that we're facing in the in the 21st century is, you know, this element of the spiritual world. I was very, very blessed at St. Vincent de Paul Regional Seminary with uh, Dr. Carol Raza and, um, you know, uh, certainly uh, uh, Monsignor Toops, as well as, uh, you know, Monsignor Michael Moore were were great support for me spiritually, uh, you know, looking at some of those realities. And and Monsignor Esif at at IPF, uh, which is another big name in, in that in that spiritual world. Yeah, but, so, I mean, all mm-hmm. priests, by virtue of the minor orders, do have the office of yeah. exorcism yes. ingrained into their ordination. Yeah, yeah, we a, actually mm-hmm. pray those during the baptism. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. Yeah, my uh, two, of, I have three kids. The um, last two were baptized according to the old rite. Mm-hmm. So we just had, uh, my daughter was baptized on the Feast of St. Rose of Lima, who oh, wow. I learned, because her name is Rose, I learned that she was one of those super saints, mm-hmm. as I call them who battled the devil much more. I didn't realize how extraordinary she was. But anyway, so we had her baptized in the extraordinary rite. And I remember watching um, uh, the priest, because he printed out these booklets so I could read along. And I think there were at least three exorcisms, like direct, like I'm, he's talking to the demon yeah. who may or may not be present inside this child, casting it out. Mm. Yeah, very, very powerful. So well, I mean... Yeah, hmm. like uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious... So. Uh, Bishop Lassard was a, a, a bishop of Charleston and uh, he Savannah. was at, or Savannah and he was at our seminary and, you know, he's just telling us stories and stuff. Super nice guy. He's, he's passed away. God rest, rest his soul. soul. Yeah. Beautiful man. But uh, yeah, he, he tells a story of a, of a possession in Savannah or whatever infestation or however you call it. And he said um, <clears throat> once he assigned the exorcist that the lady called and was like, he's, he's gone. She's fine. I feel like I've heard that recently. Have you heard that? Yeah, yeah like well, it's near you. It's near your neck of the woods, but yeah. that, that was probably the only one part of the fight. They're like, oh, it's coming. I'm just bouncing. Right. Oh, so, yeah. I, so yeah. have you heard any like, <clears throat> you know, you've got the encounter of the rite of exorcism, which would be considered a major exorcism. It's when you bring mm-hmm. all the bells and whistles and you <laughs> go at it. And that's a, I think you're bringing up you're bringing whistles. up in a very very important point though. The fullness of the office rests with the bishop. Mm-hmm. Right. That, that is the fullness of the office. And even in respect to delegation, that this is being delegated in the action of the bishop 
intentionally delegating for this particular need that is present presented. Clearly, it, 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 it you know you recall you know Jesus not even having to go to the Roman right, you know right. and, and like immediately the healing takes place because the intention has already been directed. And, and then counter to that, you also have some of these exorcists who do not want to be named publicly because there are counter attacks right. and they would rather the not spiritual and, and, and psychological. Sec, psychological. psychological. So if, yeah, I th I've read this a lot where if a certain diocese or archdiocese hasn't known who their chief exorcist of that, uh, diocese is, uh, people with psychological issues will naturally flock to them and sure. it be can become a very physically dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. In addition to, Spiritually dangerous because people who have ill intent towards the church would absolutely try to cast um, they try curses to get or whatever towards them. Curses, yeah. darkness, absolutely. All right. Yeah. So the second thing that exorcists want you to know is, you know, what actually motivates demons to do these types of spiritual attacks? What is the motivation of a demon? Now, you know, demons are real, but what's their goal? What's their end game here? Yeah. One of the things I picked up is that we all know demons are personal beings, but so I so seldom we think of them as persons, just because one of the things the exorcist, I think it was Father Fortea, said that a lot of the time, time, because they're outside of time, demons are just thinking and plotting and just mulling over their decision constantly. It's one of the torments of hell for them. Of their fall. Of their fall, you're right, the decision to fall and why exactly. And that is what motivates them. The reason, because all the demons fell, it seems, you know, related to the incarnation and Our Lady's role. And then each each demon also fell for another particular reason, and that's their sin. And the, well, that's one of the things the exorcists try to find out, because once they find that out, they can kind of push that button Ooh, and wow, hold wow. it against them. Yeah. And uh, like, so, what, would be, what would be some examples of those particular sins of, of a demon that made them fall? Is it like pride, envy, those types of things? Those, and opposing yeah. Christ's mercy, that's one of them. I think, I can't remember if it was, uh, which demon it was. It's in the book. Maybe I shouldn't say it out loud, but it's in the book, because... We'll throw the names of demons around too, too freely, but he principally opposed Christ being merciful to us. That idea, he could not tolerate it. And then when that demon manifests, I think it was Father Ripperture who said, when that demon manifests in someone, he's, he's brutal. He's a brutal demon, which makes sense because he's almost wrathful, yeah. complete opposite of mercy. Yeah. Um, but I, there are at least three, maybe some more principles that the exorcists have talked about that demons, um, the, the anything but God, I think that's how Father Ripperture worded it. Like they, they, they can't stand any anything but God. They want to keep. They want to pull us away from God, and they want to be as far away from God as they as they can. And I can't remember which exorcist it was. When it comes to their, to their thinking, that they'll think and they'll think about creation. They'll think about the existence and everything. And and because creation is ordered, it's all ordered back to God. So eventually, without them realizing, their their thoughts will take them back to thinking about God which will sting them mm -hmm. as soon as they do. And they want to recoil back. Yeah. That's almost like the, like the lapsy controversy around the DC and persecutions in the early church where uh, people who had um, not been so resolute in their faith and actually did not go to their martyrdom. Uh, what, what do you do with them? Do you, um, do you accept them back into the church? And, the big controversy is do we accept them back and do we go the way of mercy or are they outside of the church forever? And that was a, one of the really big controversies even before, you know, the legalization of, 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 of the church is to what extent can the church um, have mercy? Mm. And it did work out in the, in the way that the church went towards the direction of mercy, but it seems that demons are absolutely opposed to that direction as well. Yeah, and it's a fine line, too, between mercy and justice, you know, tolerance and calling someone to change. And I teach... You know, high school theology, one of the things we talk about is... Hey, kids, uh, he's doing a good job. That's right. <laughs> uh, so far, so good. Uh -huh. um, confession and how confession changed. Like in the early church, it was very strict. You got like one shot. After yep. baptism, you got one confession. And that caused a lot of problems. Most people waited till their deathbed for that. <laughs> yeah, and that, if you die of a heart attack before then, then, you know, we won't see you again. Um, but then when the church liberalized in the good sense of the word, the practice of offering confession, um, we all, we are very grateful. Mm -hmm. to Saint and the anointing of the sick. And, right. Yeah, right. It's true. And so in one sense, like exorcism now, I know it's, it's much more touchy than the sacraments, but it becoming more public, more people writing books and giving talks about it. It's, 
it's almost like a more liberal presentation of all of these realities. And you, and you time. mean that in very much in a generous application, generous, not yeah. liberal and, you know, yeah, Nancy Pelosi. what the word yeah. actually means. Right. Uh, yeah, that's a good it's not Nancy yeah. Pelosi just handing out free books. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. It's on Amazon. Right. It's on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> this is capitalism, son. Uh, <laughs> so, so it, it's interesting to, to look at the dynamics. So demonic influence is drawing into the company of the demons, like the subject that they are attacking. They're drawing them into, like forbidding or or resisting God's mercy in that mm -hmm. sense. But don't we even see that in our interpersonal relationships when people sin and you know how that that word sin loves company? Mm. You know, you're immediately trying to bring someone else down to your misery. And very productions do that. Like this this type of uh television show that presents family life in such a base sense so that people who have difficulties in their own life, they don't feel as bad about Wait, their own. Yeah. They're looking for justification for their own actions. It, exactly. Justification it's is the so most dangerous degrading. word in the church. Yeah. It, it, it degrades us to, to this point of like this company of, of absence, mm -hmm. you know, from God's grace and absence from Christ in the midst of all of our relationships. And I, I just, you know, we can see it visibly and it shows an entire invisible reality and you're really articulating it very well. Yeah. So the third thing that exorcist wants you to know is what are the different stages of diabolical influences? Right. Mm -hmm. You don't just go from um, being fully protected in our lady's mantle to your head spinning around and puke and right. soup. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is stages to the oppression and the influence that a demon has on you. So what are some of those stages and how do they kind of, uh, lead in, in severity. Right. So you have, uh, different kinds. So depending on the word, so you have obsession, oppression, infestation, possession, subjugation. So they're like six different stages and they're not necessarily progressive though. They can be, mm -hmm. uh, father Ripperture is the, uh, said that, uh, he, he estimates, estimates from his experiences that about 25% of the people in the country are diabolically obsessed, which could be I don't think I talk about it, but should have degrees of obsession, like mild obsession to extreme. Where so what does obsession mean in this instance? Where you're, where the uh, a demon or demons is essentially um, messing with your imagination, your thoughts, your memory to a degree that is disabling in one way or another. It could be about just one thought, a constant nagging thought that you can't shake, you can't seem to get rid of, and you don't know why it keeps coming to you, or where you're almost hearing voices. That could be, I guess, one of the extreme ones. And the whole purpose of that activity is to break you down, is mm. to drive you crazy, because there is an overlap between insanity and possession. Mm -hmm. uh, but to drive you crazy, to drive you to doubt, push God away, and then you enter into a state of mortal sin, and then they can progress from obsession to possession. Because ultimately, though possession is very rare, that's what the demons all want. They all want, they want to possess all of us and drag us down. Though it always backfires. We can get into this maybe later, but they don't really want to be noticed. Mm -hmm. They want to stay hidden, but they can't control themselves. So when they see an opportunity to possess, they take it. Mm -hmm. And then they manifest. And then it backfires because then people write books about what happened. And then everybody goes back to confession. And stupid demons. <laughs> stupid demons. Yeah. So is it, is it, <laughs> what's the, uh, again, the converse side is kind of teaching me by looking at it, but the, you know, the, uh, I, I don't want to say possession, but when we receive Holy Communion, we're, we're, we're taking mm, in God's right. very own heart, his very own blood, his very own divinity. We're becoming like what we eat. How, how, is the, how is the locality of this manifestation? Because we're talking about a lot of mm, physical right. stuff, you know, with the, with the demons and what, whatnot. With Jesus, we're... Like literally, it's illuminating your your mind, your heart, and sometimes healing your body. So the possession, this is a key, you know, and I think you all talked about this about a year ago. It's, it's in your body, whereas communion. That's why confession is so powerful because, um, well, confession goes into your soul. A sacramental of exorcism really addresses the demon's presence in your body. But holy communion is when our Lord. So let's talk about spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into your soul. Where in your soul and your body are united, so there can be an influence one over the other. Uh, whereas the demon in possession can only get into your body, but he can mess with your mind, which is your spiritual faculty. But he can't; he doesn't possess your soul. If that's kind of what no, you're that's about, yeah. exactly what I was trying to figure out. He can't possess your soul, right? He can he turn can, your soul. He can cloud your soul or darken your soul. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
which is, I mean, just as powerful. So what were those stages again of? Yeah, infestation. Which so w- infestation would be? So that's uh, in external. Okay. Um, I think I forgot another one, but infestation is external. Like they're in your house. Somehow okay. they've gotten in your house. They're messing with electronics. Oh, Things are floating around the room. Okay. Uh, scratching on the walls, pounding on the stairs, you know, doors closing and opening. No one's there. Things flying around in the kitchen. That's infestation. And and that can, uh, if you are in a state of mortal sin and you go into an infested home, you can get possessed. So they can jump. Yeah. Uh, even though possession still means. Uh, so what prayer. brings the infestation there? Because I've hear, I hear a lot of people messing with Ouija boards and doing all this stuff. Yeah. That, does that infest, is that, is that sort of thing infest something or does something that dark that happened there through somebody like, where does that infestation occur? Because you're, you're going from the mind to now you're going to a spatial. Right. right. So know. both, the both things. So uh, anything that's happened in the dwelling prior to the previous occupants being there can cause an infestation. There's a, I, I referenced it a couple of times. This is one of the first things I read before I started down this path to write the book was the demon of Brownsville road. I'm not sure if you've read that book, mm-hmm. it's about true story of a home infestation in Pennsylvania it was resolved in the early 2000s, 2002, I think. But the home became infested most likely in the 1940s or 50s due to um, abortions that were practiced in the home mm. where both the children, obviously, but also some of the mothers died. My goodness. And there was some s- suspicion of satanic things that happened too, uh, maybe some curses left in the foundation of the home, so cursed items. But this demon got in, and every occupant from that point forward was kind of Attacked. Attacked, wanted to get out. And when the person who bought the home, drawing a blank on his name, but it's it's in the book and you can find it. Um, he, when he moved in, it was like it's this home he remembered from his childhood and he wanted to buy it and it was for sale. It's kind of like twisted providence. Um, but the kids saw the demon when they went to visit the house and no one believed them. It, it is very, very interesting because I've had a little bit of training in Ignatian spirituality, and I, I really incline toward that type of a spirituality where the initial attack is in thought, mm-hmm. and, and that's where it, it, it begins. Or in which, this instance, you know, in that infestation. Well, know? yeah, but, but, you know, like the, the thought process is, is the initial, initial attack. But what you're describing in, in all these various things from – you know, oppression and, you know, or excuse me, obsession, oppression, infestation, obsession, you know, like these, these types of power and of clearly possession I've heard, but I've never heard uh, subjugation before, which is, which is, which is pretty interesting. And it's, it's helping me to focus more clearly on these, these various demonic levels and tactics that are very, very clear. And, and I'm really appreciative of, of the yeah. book and your, your mission right now, so, and your ministry. So what is subjugation? So that's when um, an individual intentionally, the, so the intent is really important, intentionally makes an agreement with a demon, with, makes a pact. Mm-hmm. And as the exorcists point out, demons aren't bound to any promises, and, but the, often they come through with what they promise. So there are some famous ones, which is in the book, uh, John Lennon um, uh, famously made a pact for 20 years of fame, and he got it. And 20 years to the day, he was shot and killed. And I haven't found all the details about this, but the man who, uh, I was trying to find it before I finished the final, the second edition of the book, but the man who shot him was apparently um, being driven basically to kill him. Like voices were talking to him to kill John Lennon, yeah. kill John Lennon. I, remember, I do remember that. Mark it's David Chapman, public. yeah. And then he, and as I recall, he was exercised of five demons. Oh, wow. The man who shot John Lennon. And uh, they repeated the pact, like renewed the pact, close to the 20-year time when it ran up. And yeah, there are, I re- mentioned three books that are good biographies on that whole, that whole thing. But uh, so that's one. Wow, I've but, never heard that. And also on, uh, if you, uh, uh, there's another documentary about a lot of musicians who have entered into pacts yep. as well. I can't remember the name of it right now, but it's all on YouTube. Uh, but it also happens on just like normal, normal people, our approach, like my, my story, I have another book I'll talk to you about called uh, Swords and Shadows, which is spiritual warfare for teenagers. And I talk about my conversion and my youth. And um, I went through a lot of you know, like rejection, isolation, bullying, things like that. So when you're in a situation like that, you crave, you crave power because you have none. And that's one of the times when the devil, his, his demons will step in to offer his assistance. That's right. And it, it happens. Like one of the exorcists met a boy who was in a, I think it was a juvenile detention center. 
or he was there because he attacked a police officer, I think it was. And some, for some reason, they thought there was something satanic here, so they called the exorcist to talk to him. And the boy admitted that at one point, Satan uh, appeared to him as a father figure and offered to be his father in exchange for who knows what. But, and the boy said, I could never, I could never give this up. Because the, the power, the kind of power I now have in my life, I could never, I could never say no to. So he didn't want to be exercised. He didn't want to, uh, he wanted to stay possessed, essentially. And that's happened. There are other cases like that. Or subjugated. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, it's a pact. There's others, a uh, uh, fr- priest friend of ours, Father McCune, um, he, he, he ran into somebody that was infested or subjugated or infested and uh, he was abused as a child. And, and, and there was a dark shadow that came to him that asked uh-huh. him, you know, would you let me, you know, hold your hand through all this and move you through it. So, wow. so he remembers that is this is a child. This is a child, mm. you know, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's crazy going back to like the spatial stuff, which is really interesting yeah. to me. Infestation. <laughs> Infestation. Cause it's, it's interesting to me because it's, it's, there's no person being subjugated, infested or whatever. There is a presence there that has infiltrated the spatial realities of our world. Right. What, keeps them there is it just like a bastion that they set up that they can use is it like a portal you know what i mean i'm thinking yeah. like sci-fi here like you <laughs> that's know? right you know what i'm saying um well the the demons are territorial and okay. there's a great quote i wish i could spatially flip right territorial there. they want to take i mean the the world used to be uh unchallenged like satan had unchallenged dominion prior to the incarnation and Pope Leo the Thirteenth, in one of his document on um, that's Free- excellent. <laughs> on Freemasonry, he talks about how the world is divided into two kingdoms: <coughs> the kingdom of Satan, and everybody who uh, sins mortally is in that kingdom, and then the kingdom of God, who everybody who's baptized and does God's will is in that kingdom. So the demons, they're uh, they're, they're going to go down with a fight, and, and so they're, they're trying to take over the world, and that's why the church consecrates things, blesses. Property, you know, gotcha. space, land, everything you own can be blessed. Gotcha. Because the demons can infest it. That's one reason. Like the reason we, I learned this, uh, I think it was 10 years ago, another one of those little seeds throughout my life that pointed me in this direction that a, a priest told me, he said, eating unblessed food is the surest way to get possessed. And I thought he was joking. He was like, I'm I've not. i that too. <laughs> he wasn't joking. And then I learned like, like demons can infest crops, food, anything. That's why we say the blessing. Oh, to wow. and like the Saint Benedict, you know, he blessed that chalice that had been poisoned, and it shattered as soon as he did. But if he hadn't blessed it, he would have consumed the poison. Dang! But it's also also say your blessings, <laughs> people. Right. Yeah. Say the blessing. <laughs> yeah, I, right. I often forget because I'm a hungry dude. The <laughs> beef jerky I had a minute ago. I said a blessing before I had the beef yeah. jerky. <laughs> no, lay people can bless their own food. Just without the sign of the cross, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. Just with the and, sign and, of the and cross, and that's an, that's an without, important. No, they can, it. but they yeah. can't bless their food, like as a true blessed item. Then. They can call down God's blessing yes. upon it, yeah. and they have authority over their home mm-hmm. also, as well as their children. And you share that authority in virtue of the priesthood that is associated with your baptism. Mm-hmm. So to make intercession and to make sacrifice, that's why whenever I hear of someone, look, Father, there's some dark stuff happening in my house. I give them a, a vial of holy water. Mm-hmm. I say, call down a blessing on your on your home. Sprinkle the holy water. If there's still some issues, call me. Right. Almost like 99.9% of the time. Good to go. You're good, you're good to go. Yeah, when you're moving into a new house, I mean... I, I get immediately, it immediately offices, have it blessed. Offices, everything. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, we were three days after we bought our house. The priest was over there to bless us. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I, I find it absolutely fascinating. Uh, you know, the, the power of Jesus Christ and the sacramentals. I am an absolute fanatic when it comes, when it comes, yeah. to, so when it comes to that. Yeah. So that's one of the things we're going to talk about. Now, before we talk about that, I want to let you know about our sponsor. So, We want to give a big shout out to our sponsors, Exodus 90, as well as Hallow. Exodus 90 is a great program out there for all men considering taking the next step in their faith journey. With other brothers, they spend 90 days living austerely and praying and performing different acts of penance and austerity. Now, I've done this experience. Cold showers aren't too bad. And praying through Exodus can only give you a greater sense of an impetus to break through the chains of your own life with other brothers finding greater freedom in the prayer life. We also want to recognize our sponsor, Hallow. 
a great application that has quickly become the number one prayer app on the App Store. So be sure to check out Hallow, and there you'll find all these beautiful prayers that they've uploaded from daily meditations to rosary to scripture, Lexio Divina, and so much more. These young people were inspired by the applications like Calm that are out there, and this helps people calm down and meditate and center their thoughts. Well, this is a great form of meditative prayer in the Catholic tradition that's being driven through an application. Hallow creates a wonderful sense of our Catholic heritage of prayer, and they have just about everything, and they're continuing to expand their product as time goes on, so be sure to check them out. And if you do, visit their website and use the promo Catholic Talk Show, and you'll get premium contact for, for content for 30 days. And by using that, you'll be able to explore their full capacity of what they're offering. So be sure to check out Hallow, a great app for prayer. You're bringing up sacramentals, and that's one of the things that exorcists want you to know is how you can resist diabolical influences and the roles of sacramentals like blessed salt, holy water, um, rosaries, um, scapulars. Those types of things can really be your armor in you know diabolical mm -hmm. battle. Rosary. Yeah, you think of it kind of like superstitious, piety, metal. things like that. But when you start talking about infestations and the spatial realities and even this house, then it's like, okay, this is our weapon. Yeah. Dude. And now is it really that superstitious? Let, let me tell you, man, I, there was this guy, like I, was a youth, I was a youth director at a, at a parish in Flagler with Father mm -hmm. Tetlow. Yeah. That's when we first, we first met. And this guy was calling like every day, like, you know, I need a priest. I need a priest to come over. And I finally, I, I grabbed a hold of Father Tetler. I'm like, we need to go over to this guy's house. He lived up in the hammock. He had, you know, this nice uh, house. Yeah. It, no, it was actually, it was it, the, the hammock part is nice, but then there's like uh, trailer homes and uh -huh. like kind of, le you know, less fortunate uh, area. And we went there and I walked in and talk about sacramentals because there's, there's also visible signs that confer negative <laughs> grace as opposed to, uh, you know, the sacraments of our church and our sacramental theology. I walk in and this guy has dream catchers, huge dream catchers that he's he's built with, uh, you know, driftwood and all this stuff that he would find on the ocean. And he brought it in and and the whole place was just caked in darkness and the smell and the and the feeling, the gut instinct of walking into this environment. Mm -hmm. And and I looked through all of this darkness and I saw this beautiful painting on the wall of Jesus Christ and his authority, like pointing his finger. Wow. Right. And I immediately like pointed my finger. I'm not even a priest, you know, I'm like, I'm pointing my finger. I'm like, all this stuff needs to go now. And like the guy, when he's like ripping all this stuff down, he's just chucking it out the front door of his trailer. trailer home, <laughs> and he's like, throwing, I'm going through all this stuff in his house. I'm like, that needs to go. That needs to go. That needs to go. And you just see all this stuff flying out of the house. And I grab the holy water. And I'm like, Father Tetlow, do your thing. And he just he just started blessing the house, Ooh, man. Awesome. One of my, my most favorite, favorite stories with yeah. Father Tetlow, those initial years of ministry, you know, at his yeah. at his side. But that's so cool. yeah. What kind of advice uh do exorcists give on resisting diabolical influence? And what are some of the sacramentals specifically that are recommended? Yeah, and it really is an arsenal. Um, I think I have a list in there of like nine when I decide to list them. Like, so you have uh, holy water, and there's a great quote from St. Teresa of Avila. Just she would splash holy water everywhere. I think she would drink it too, which you can do as long as it's fresh. You mm -hmm. don't get sick from it by dipping their finger in it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so holy water, and the exorcists do say it that both the newer form of blessing and the traditional form work, but the traditional form has a bigger impact. And then the even more traditional, if you can say that, the epiphany water, which is blessed for like 45 minutes mm -hmm. uh, on epiphany, only on epiphany, as far as I know has an even more powerful, it's like a double exorcism. As, as I've one. never done that before. I need to do that. I do the traditional form all the time. You do? Yeah. Awesome. And uh, so do holy it, water. Do it, right? <laughs> do it. You start there, and then you got blessed salt, which goes in the traditional holy water, which you can use separately. It mm -hmm. lingers longer. Um, blessed oil, exercised oil is another name for it. Blessed candles, which I had never, ever known about prior to doing this research. So what are blessed candles? Uh, any candle. I don't think it has to be a certain percentage of wax. Not the 99 cent I, ones. I from, don't know. Uh, I guess so. Fiesta. That's on my Fiesta. list. I have like, 40, <laughs> I have like <laughs> 40 questions to ask exorcists for a follow-up book. One of them was like, does it matter what kind of candle? They haven't said, so I don't think. 
Because Father Ripperger said you should get every candle in your house blessed. Yeah, you, and my holy candle of winter sweater by Yankee Candle. Ooh, yes. Take that, Satan, punk. <laughs> and it has an exorcism What a chrism on it. candle. I wonder if they Ooh. make chrism candle. They do. Do they? Yeah. Nice. Oh. And then, so, blessed candles, yeah, and wherever that is, whether it's lit or not, which is neat, that's the wording in the blessing, it drives demons <coughs> out of the air, because mm -hmm. exorcists point out that demons can occupy the atmosphere. They can cause storms. There are actual masses mm -hmm. and prayers against tempests and storms. I'm about <laughs> to share something that I've, I you didn't think very rarely me? say, but, um, you know, the whole essential oils thing, you know, mm -hmm. it's like kind of a craze, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people are getting into them. Um, I've done a lot of research, scripture, oils and all of that. And I, and I bless oils mm -hmm. all the time for use devotionally, um, as well as obviously using the oils that the bishop entrusts to the priests uh, for healing and sickness, sickness, um, the anointing of the sick. But um, when I'm feeling particularly attacked, you know, and when, when I'm really feeling like, you know, I'm, I'm under it right now, mm -hmm. um, I take the frankincense oil that I, that I've blessed and I put it in a tub of water and I, I put the frankincense in there along with like valor that I bless and uh, put it in the diffuser and I just like load up my house, holy wow. water. And I just hop in the, I hop in the tub and I bless the, I bless the, the water. water. And I'm just like, you know, it's like a fumigation and, and it is, I mean, it, it's straight up, man. Like, and, and I'll be very, very honest. There's some t attacks. Like I grab a hold of that Padre Pio beard that I don't want to share with you. And I'm like, he, has, you know, a, he has a relic of Padre Pio's beard oh, and he won't wow. give us each a hair. <laughs> wow. I'll no. see what I could do. No I don't want to split hairs really. Uh, uh, that's good. Uh, uh, that's a good one. But, but, um, they're there. Right. And to, to have your priests bless, these oils I've had, I've had, uh, you know, different people in the parish who uh, use oils a lot. And when I shared with them that I'd be happy to bless them for them, they mm -hmm. were very, very overjoyed, mm -hmm. uh, with, with that. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of grace in that area as well. And the super abundance of sacramentals is actually recommended. Like if you struggle with uh, diabolical nightmares, one of the recommendations is to put holy water all over your anoint essentially with holy water, your senses before you go to sleep, top of your head, ears, eyes, and then go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And it works. It, it has an effect. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things. So yeah, blessing the water in the mm -hmm. tub. I mean, why not? You somebody know? gave, somebody gave me a, uh, a spritzer of holy water with the divine mercy. A <laughs> it's a spritzer. So I just, he's just like, uh, <laughs> I do. I, I, you know, I've got to refill it, but, uh, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> it's a little divine mercy spritzer. <laughs> Um, <laughs> any other ones that we missed? Yeah, the St. Benedict Medal and the Miraculous mm -hmm. Medal. We all got a St. Benedict Medal. Miraculous Medal. Miraculous. I've not taken my St. Benedict this Medal off in five years. I mean, not even for 1800s, a minute. 1800s, dude. You want to know what's Miraculous interesting? Metal. I don't know if this is a demon. I don't think it was. But my scapular broke last night. See, one of the people we work with is scapulars.com. And they, Interesting. And they promised the strongest, most comfortable scapular ever. I, don't know. I might need to check that mm -hmm. out. Check it out. They look <laughs> yeah. really good. I mean, honestly, that's a free plug for you I'm guys. I'm thinking but, Patreon. Scapular. Ooh, that would be cool. I'll, yeah. I'll talk to scapulars.com and we can get something worked out. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. Because I otherwise, but I have it in my pocket, so the mm -hmm. demon can't take it very far. Though yeah. I don't think it was a demon. It's an old scapular. Uh, it's like yeah. 14 years old. Yeah. But uh, so scapulars, miraculous medal, St. Benedict medal, rosaries. Um, rosaries, relics, sacred images, icons, statues, all of these things can receive specific blessings. Crucifixes can get a specific, uh, extraordinary form, you know, the old right. Roman ritual blessing, um, probably some more. I mean, yeah, I'm sure the church has a lot. Yeah. But one of the keys, superstition versus sacramental, one of the keys is to use it with faith. Like all of the exorcists, the Adam Bly is one I, I reckon, uh, reference a couple times. He's, I'm not sure if you know him, but he's a lay demonologist. He's, I can't remember his titles, but he's officially recognized by his bishop. It's a certain role. He advises exorcists, works with them. And he's kind of just providentially pulled into this ministry, but he has videos online and some books and just a wealth of knowledge, but he emphasized in one of his talks um, about having faith when using the sacramentals, which is key to the church. I mean, you have to have faith, like indulgences. You can't get them unless what you're doing is you is done with devotion. Yeah, they're not magic spells. They're actually tied to, specifically to your faith and to your, your state, you know, that's not... Um, a formula necessarily yeah. as a action that is expressed in a physical reality. 
Mm-hmm. And then when I first discovered these sacramentals, I'll tell a brief little story. It's a longer story, but I'll make it brief. My The pastor, so the chaplain at my school, um, he knows all this stuff. And he's very free, like, yeah, I'll, I'll bless the oil, I'll bless your candles. So we had him over for a, a brunch. You got to have the priest over for a meal <laughs> when you get him to do things like this. Yeah. And uh, he blessed uh, oil, candles, anything that was not blessed, like some rosaries. Uh, we already had holy water, blessed salt. And then from that day forward, as a Saturday, I started using all of them as much as possible. Candles were lit for every meal. I was trying to find, you can put blessed salt and blessed oil in your food. You just can't toss it out. You have to try your best to consume it. I think there's a little liberality there, like holy water, you're just spraying it everywhere. You can't keep track of it all. Mm -hmm. But I was using them all with this intense devotion because I just discovered all this. It was kind of like this honeymoon period. And like, now I have the sacramentals. And like, just, I was saying the prayers, repeating the prayers from the blessings every time I used them. And the following Wednesday, I went to confession, you know, nothing abnormal, just to the same priest. And I had for like the first time ever, just tears, tears of sorrow over my sins, which I had never, ever experienced before. And right after that, uh, that same day, it was like a veil had been just pulled back from my eyes and I was able to see exactly what spiritual battle I was in, like exactly what trap Satan had set up for me all throughout my day, 24 hours a day, like where he had set traps. And I'd never, ever, ever experienced anything like that. But it happened right after with faith, using all these sacramentals, tapping into that grace. And it changed my spiritual life permanently. Well, this was January. And, yeah, um, I, I bought a, a bag of salt um, from the Pope's uh, salt in Italy. And I had all of, every intention to give it to Father Rich to have it blessed. And then we ate it all. <laughs> and then he spilled uh, that's it. That's true. That's true. So uh, I, st- I still owe you a bag paella. of Sali de Papi. I know, man. Yeah. I still and owe I, you one. After this show. Doesn't your wife have like a relationship <laughs> or something? No, I'll yeah. get you some. Yeah, yeah, awesome. She used to, but no. I'm going to put you to work at my house tonight. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> You're blessing <laughs> everything. Yeah. You're blessing everything. You're going to be up to like <laughs> three in the morning just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she gets you to work, dude. Next candle. <laughs> Next candle. <laughs> Bottle of bourbon, <laughs> whatever. Here we go. Might be. There, no, there, is, there is blessing for alcohol, absolutely. Uh, yeah. but, that, but I was actually thinking of that. Uh, you think of the, st- like, what is it, Stone Brewery, right? Like, they have yeah. the demon on the on yeah. the label. Or yeah. when we did that Trappist episode, mm-hmm. but and you didn't I know selected the, difference the, between the devil's the tr- elbow or something. Devil, like, the devil's, devil's backbone. 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 Yeah, he, yeah, he whiffed. And I I totally lost, and I had to eat a cricket. <laughs> you know, uh, there there was... Uh, it happened. Okay. But there, it's interesting, like, wouldn't you want to drink beer that was prepared at the hands of monks, Trappist monks that were blessed Almost for consumption. exclusively. Exclusively. That's, that's legit. That. We're yeah. talking about a, our pilgrimage uh, to, to Poland, yep. you know, and to Rome that, w- that we're going to visit this, this Trappist location where they brew. Trey Fontaine. Trey Fontaine, mm-hmm. where they, in Rome, where, where St. Paul was beheaded. I had no idea that they, that they brew beer there. So they the, certainly do. Keep that in mind when you're, when you're buying your Coors Light. Maybe you should go with more Trappist Actually, beer. Actually, Coors are... Oh, of course, it's great Catholic, Catholic people. That's right. right. They okay. really are. That my know. parents, you're good. Yeah, I've actually, I'm actually, I've actually met the him at um, at a Napa, I yeah. like, and I was drinking one. And I'm like, this is too cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Line and Kugel, isn't that uh, in yeah. Wisconsin? They're in Wisconsin. Catholic family. I don't yeah. know. I'm not sure. Yeah, some Milwaukee's research. got some bad infestations. They got the Milwaukee's best. They the call beast. it the beast. The beast. The beast. Oh man, that, yeah. <laughs> There's a you wake up and you have a headache. That's I think the devil likes that. Do you guys beer. remember Milwaukee's best ice? Oh yeah, oh, dude. That, that is straight Lord. up oppression. What Lord. about Natty Ice? Do you ever oh, have any of that? Any that ice. was big in Florida. Ice, Gosh, yeah, that was bottom, awful. Bottom, oh, it was terrible. Bottom light ice. <laughs> I never had. That's worse like when you, that's like you've got like four dollars and you get twelve beers. Yeah, there's no clearly. Yeah, not yeah this good. is not the drinking no, show. That's not modern. No. So um, <laughs> another thing that exorcists want you to know is how they know what it is that they know. You know, and there's a very specific reason that they know these things um, that are kind of behind this veil, and that's because demons tell them. Yeah. They hear things during exorcisms that you would not believe. So what are some of those things that they know that they, and how do they know that? Yeah. Um, well, how demons, how demons get into people is one thing they learn because one of the things they need to ask the demon is what sin was committed that allowed, that permitted you, they can either get permission or a right, permitted you to come in. So exorcists learn like what all, like Ouija boards, all this occult stuff, how it actually does open doors and demons can just walk right in. Even you mentioned abuse. Like a lot of exorcists see that that people who are, were abused have 
that's not the cause of diabolical problems, but it causes a grave wound. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then that wound can be played on by the demons mm -hmm. and then they can find and a in way. And in that desperation of the subjective wound that one is suffering, it creates a desperation right, and a pushes, crying out. Yeah, Pushes them away from God. Mm -hmm. Now they're fair game. So things like that. And even, um, again, like the power of the sacramentals, we, they teach us that because they see how it works. But even what the demons are, are up to in the world, like um, not talking about current events at the moment, but um, like one of the earliest things, I think it's 2005, uh, a priest friend of mine went to an exorcism conference. I think it was in Rome. It was right after Pope Benedict had been elected. And the exorcists were sharing stories. This is one of the things they do at the conferences. They'll, they'll tell what, what, hearing on the, yeah, yeah. what did you hear? Oh, I heard something similar like this. And they'll see a theme, <coughs> they'll see a thread. It'll all go into the science of what these demons are up to. Dude. But one exorcist had the demons talking because not all the time, but usually there are multiple demons. And they some some exorcists will say they travel in clusters. They always travel in groups. Others will say they don't. They travel singly, but they bring in like reinforcements or the network is there. So if one's there, they can just tap in mm -hmm. to as many as they want. So it's essentially like the whole army can be called in. But this exorcist got these three demons talking and he just stepped back and just listened. And they were talking about the election of Pope Benedict. And they, whatever they were saying, they, they said, uh, she kept getting in the way. And the she was Our Lady. That Our Lady was interfering with the diabolical plan to frustrate the election process of the new Pope, of Pope Benedict. So, and then, of course, current times, we have uh, the call by those four exorcists for prayer, fasting, and reparation um, on December 6th. And it seems like some of the news we were just talking about earlier was that the reason those four anonymous exorcists, that's important. I was like, who are these guys? And then I realized they're, they want to be anonymous for a good reason. They have been learning by mo exorcisms in recent the days chatter. and weeks. The chatter, yeah, the, cha the, the chatter in the diabolical channels is that they're up to something. And we, something they don't big? Know, something big. We don't know exactly what. Uh, Father Heilman, I think that's how you pronounce his name, from Roman Catholic Man. He was talking about it on a, on a show. I can't remember what the call, show was called. So that's like a developing story. I didn't even hear about that. So the, so the four anonymous exorcists are calling for prayer, fasting, yes. and reparation. And reparation. Um, and that's to go down on December 6th, Feast of, December 6th. Feast of St. Nicholas, man. Beautiful. Yeah, the, uh, the Aryan. Yeah, man, what a tough guy, <laughs> man. That's a, good, that's a good feast day to do it on. It's also a first Friday, which I yeah. think is oh, why they picked it. Is first Friday. Yeah, they said it's for the purpose of driving out any diabolical influence within the church that has been gained as the result of recent events. Hmm. Which I'm assuming they're talking about Pachamama and things like that. They, yeah, they named that yeah, later on in their statement. Yeah. Did they? Okay. The exorcist yeah. did? Specifically yeah. because that happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And they think that may have opened a door. Yeah. They didn't. They haven't said what. Mm -hmm. I think all we need to know, like sometimes exorcists don't want to tell us everything. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing because yeah. it can get really dark mm -hmm. and we don't need to know. Then that there's like curiosity is in the book too. We don't well, want to yeah, be curiosity curious. of the demonic is dangerous thing. Well, I mean, look, yeah. at, look at an unhealthy uh, curiosity. I, I yeah. think, I think the demonic wants you to have that curiosity yeah. because it will consume you. And you look at like all this violent media Horror movies and, just, and all yeah. this stuff. And, and I'm not like saying like every, you know, you can watch one or whatever, but the purpose of this, horror the purpose of this sickness or twistedness in films is that consummation you're consuming this stuff and you're leaving a space for something to come in or just it changes the way you think about stuff curiosity yeah. could breed obsession yeah mm -hmm. and being obsessed right. with with these uh these dark realities you know that's not that's not how why we were created we were created for wonder and awe we yeah. were created for the beauty and truth and goodness of God and mm -hmm. being in communion with that makes us alive. To be fully alive. To be fully alive. Yeah. And and when we are fully alive in Christ, we have no worries because our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And we are right. receiving the charism of our very nature and we're remembering that we are in the image and likeness of God. We we are the ones who are occupied by light in the name of Christ. Yeah, so the fascination of of, of this topic should lead us to, you know, the 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 direction of, you know, this is fascinating, but however, mm -hmm. this is to real. abandon ourselves more in the sacramental it church. Really like, I more really want to give myself more. Yeah. Fascination, I think, is maybe not even, it's more about preparation as being aware of this stuff is preparation. Yeah. Fascination can lead to obsession, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. preparation and knowing that you do need to 
gird yourself in this battle is very and important. The, and that's and that's why we're so lucky to have Charles. And, on. and that's why we have this book that Charles that Charles published, Slaying Dragons. Make sure that you check that out. Yeah, I'll on, put that link on here. But yeah, get this book. This book is. Mm-hmm. Wow, I mean, awesome. I, I'm getting blown away here. This is really awesome. Fantastic yeah. episode. Let's not so well, we got Christ two, is king. We got two more things to cover. Okay. Right. So, um, what actually happens during an exorcism? Right. Mm. Exorcists want you to know that it is not like TV, but it yeah. also sometimes it is. is. Yeah. The uh, exorcism. Uh, what's it called? The Exorcist. The movie mm-hmm. is like you just said. It's not real, but kind of real. Mm-hmm. It's based on a true story of, uh, I'm not sure if you know the true mm-hmm. story. St. Louis. Yeah. yeah, boy playing with a Ouija board. Mm-hmm. So it started with curiosity and then infestation in the house and then more curiosity and then possession. Those were how they all overlapped. Um, and then it, then it went from there. Um, but so the head spinning and the, the green vomit, that doesn't happen. Head spinning would kill you. <laughs> so, okay. The, the demons have to operate in the natural world. They can't. And they're not allowed to kill you. They can orchestrate things. That's uh, oppression, which we haven't talked about. But so, yeah, the, the, um, they try to get the, so there's a dialogue first. Once the prayers start, usually there's some kind of manifestation. Um, typically, which is interesting, the, like, the eyes will roll back. And so they have two different kinds of demons, uh, which St. Mark talks about, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, closed demons, he doesn't name it this. He says there are many kinds. Closed demons and open demons. So the closed demons will just shut down and hide. And try to hide as long as possible. Some will hide so well that only an experienced exorcist can tell he's actually there. And then exorcists know to bring in help if they can't. Like, I know something's there, but I am not getting anywhere. Open demons, as soon as the exorcism starts, they'll just appear and start, like, mocking the priest. Sometimes the the person will flip from... You're no Mike Schmidt's exorcist. (laughs) I knew it, dude. (laughs) I'm going to bring my... I'm going to get my exercise salts on you, man. We should should have a pile right here. (laughs) (laughs) We should have Um, some in here. um, But, um, yeah, the person will flip from, Father, I I really need your help. Let's start this exorcism. And that's how it's been for months, too. I don't don't need any help. I'm okay. The complete flip of personality. And then the person will start mocking the priest, laughing at everything he does. Like, what are you doing? That's so silly. Especially if it's a not an experienced exorcist, the demon knows the inexperience because the demons watch everything we do. And that's something to, to remember. That's why you have to stay in the kingdom of light because if the light is blinding them, they can't see. Some of the prayers of the Auxilium Christianorum, which is in my book, are about blinding the demons so they can't tell what we're up to. Beautiful. Dude. Isn't that great? Oh, I love that. <laughs> that's so cool. That's uh, awesome. So... Open, open and closed. That's the first time I've ever, ever heard of anything like that. But it's interesting because I could see, I could see that, you know, like you said, that's in the gospel of Mark where he talks about different kinds of Mm -hmm. demons. Yeah. And then you can play on that. What they see are open and closed. That's fascinating. And then, uh, yeah, so some will cooperate and some will not. Mm -hmm. Um, Ultimately they have to cooperate. So eventually as you progress, the exorcist gains authority over it. And that's by getting the name figuring out how the demon got there. Uh, the demon's only allowed to stay for a certain amount of time. That's one of the wonderful things. One of the things that really stood out was how our Lord controls everything. He permits demons to purify us, punish us, lead us back to him, and scare the hell out of us so we won't go there. But the demons can't do anything that our Lord doesn't allow them to do, which is so comforting. These demons are, are on a leash. So they, there, there's been a lot of talk about changing the Our Father and lead us not into temptation. And they're like, well, God does not lead us into temptation. But I think that speaks to that fact that God does let us be put to the test. Yeah. And the Council of Trent, it takes up that language. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I mean, he... God obviously allows Job to be tempted. Yeah. He allows his own son, God himself, to be tempted in the desert. God does lead us to to tests that are meant to purify us and strengthen us. And this is where mm-hmm. theologians shed light on God's permissive will. And it's mm-hmm. important to realize what you're saying and what we're describing is that God allows in his permissive will these things to happen for a greater good. And mm-hmm. I think that's what is being said and to me in the Our Fathers. Don't put me to that test because I'm too afraid to, t- to handle it. Right. Or, yeah, and kind of an Im- implicit, like, prepare me. Yeah. You know, don't. Test me when I'm not ready. Exactly. Because I'm going to break. No pop tests. And you're a teacher. <laughs> that's right. I so, don't do pop tests. Good. See? Uh, you your uh, students uh, must love right. you, buddy. I don't do that's, pop that's tests. That's excellent. <laughs> Except for right after the show airs. Uh, <laughs> um, um, so what else happens during exorcisms? Yeah. So eventually um, there's a critical point that's reached where the demon starts to lose his hold because the, 
the priest is constantly commanding the demon to depart, um, commanding the demon to reveal things, and all these things agitate the demon and cause the demon to to lose his stability. Um, sometimes that's when you'll see, or around this time, multiple demons. Like if they're lesser demons, they'll flee, they'll run away because they're weak. Some demons are weak, some demons are strong, and some demons are really strong. Like there's like like the highest ones, the ones mentioned in sacred scripture. Um, so then you'll you'll wash away some of the lower demons and realize who you're dealing with. Um, Adam Bly was on, I think it was the Patrick Coffin show. I was watching that great episode. You, you should get him on here, Adam Bly. That um, all the exorcists, including him, talk about how the demons move in like military units. It's very organized. The foot soldiers are up front. They take the 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 brunt of the because uh, the exorcism is a beating. It's that was one of, one of the other fascinating things is. They all say that the exorcisms hurt, really, really actually hurt the demons. That that's what causes the demons to leave because they're in pain. Um, so they just can't take it after a certain point. So they'll progress, and then there's a certain point where the demons start to lose control. Um, actually, let me rewind a little bit. There are certain signs the exorcists look for to make sure that there's a demon there once the exorcism progresses. like The person knows things they should not know. Secret things, occult knowledge is what it's kind of called. Um, things that the priest did that no one knows except the priest. Um, if if, they, the, if you ever in an exorcism, they're like, we know that you pretend that you have a stick shift, but you actually have an automatic and you roll your car back on hills. <laughs> oh. Like, that's weird. Uh, they must okay. be a demon. How did you know I did How did you know I do that? That's <laughs> a strange thing to do. <laughs> Be ready in case you're called to be an exorcist. <laughs> <laughs> Not a sin, but just, it's like, why do you do that? It's really you, strange. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's um, superhuman strength. You know, um, the one exorcist told the story when he was watching, when he was training, that the exorcist brought in this frail old lady who was kind of, you know, hunched over. And before she came in, he set up a heavy metal chair in the center of the room on purpose. And he, the, the training exorcist, the trainee, didn't know why. But this little old lady sat down. And as soon as the exorcism started, it was an, it was an open demon, just manifested, hackling, laughing, eventually stood up, picked up the chair, probably weighed about 50 pounds or so, and just started, like, swinging it around in the air. Oh. And, like... And that, that's typical, like uh, a, a 10-year-old girl can pick up five grown men. I'm, I'm really curious, like, how? Like, is there a force involved, or is she actually Wait, holding them all? How does that actually, yeah, physically the actual work? physics of that? That's one of my follow-ups. You know, uh, I think that speaks to how you said that there's kind of a, a, a militaristic structure and that there's front lines. Uh, that speaks to, like, in the Gospel of Luke uh, 11, 20, uh, 24 to 26, that when an unclean spirit goes out of someone, it roams the arid region, searching at first for rest. But finding none, it says, I shall return to my home from which I came. And upon returning, it finds it swept and clean and put in order. Then it goes back and brings seven other spirits more wicked than itself who move in and dwell there. And the last condition of the person is worse than the first. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's. And the exorcists see it. Yeah. Like if you relapse from a liberation, which is what they call it when the demons removed. If you relapse and get possessed again, it's worse. It's going to be worse, uh, which actually fits with the early church's view on confession. Mm -hmm. You know, if we offer it too much, like, you know, do you really care? Are right. you really sorry? Um, so what there, actually happens then at the moment when the extra, the, when the demon or demons are driven out, what is that liberation? What is that moment like? Mm, yeah. Um, uh, I can say a little bit. I didn't, they didn't dwell on like there are certain signs, um, uh, certain commands the demon was told he must fulfill and then depart. Um, but often it's just, you know, the, from what I remember, it's just a sense of peace is just imparted directly to the person right afterwards. Sometimes, actually, um, a saint or Our Lady will show up. Uh, it sounds like in Adam Bly's talk, which I just listened to about three days ago, he said almost every time in an exorcism towards the end, Our Lady just shows up on her own. And she's mentioned in the book several times, like she is basically, though she's not God, basically all powerful over the demons. And Father Ripperger told a great story. Uh, this is how the little... And I love that his name is Chad. It's so funny. <laughs> I know. And that's... <laughs> he's, he's a total Chad. <laughs> <laughs> um, he told a story. He, he's FSSP, right? FSSP. Yeah. yeah. Actually, well, I think he is or he was because he started the Dolorin Fathers, which is a religious order. Okay. So I guess he may have had to leave FSSP okay. first to do that. Um, I think he's in Colorado currently, mm -hmm. but he told the story of a man who was possessed and liberation was approaching. And all of a sudden he started having a vision, the possessed man, which is not uncommon. And our lady was descending into him. I'm not sure how it worked. And 
if I hopefully I can get it right. It's in the book in greater detail. And the, the abyss was opened, like a chasm beneath the man was opened, and the demon was ripped out of him and just cast straight into the abyss. And that was the liberation. It wasn't necessarily the rite of exorcism that did it, because the rite of exorcism is a sacramental. Like, I guess if the demon leaves in the middle of it, you can just stop, as long as the demon's actually gone, which mm -hmm. has to be verified. But if she shows up, it's over. She has, what is it, perfect coercive power over demons. And the, all the way back to St. Alphonsus Liguori, St. Louis de Montfort, they talk about the... the Liguori is so good. Yeah. He's, he's great. What of demons? Um, they talk about the what? Oh, the... Uh, yeah, you interrupted us. <laughs> um, um, no, I forgot. The, how yeah. the perfect power, coercive power. Oh, yeah. How, how the demons just can't stand Our Lady's presence in any way, shape, or form. They fear her threats more than, than their torments in hell. Like they don't partly because of who she is that they, they fear her more than God only because of her humility. And she's a creature. The fact that she has perfect coercive power over them and she's a creature. Oh yeah. Could it Just be fear or tough, despise or hate her pill to swallow? I think everything. We, talk, we talked about that in a previous ex, uh, you know, episode <clears throat> that St. Joseph, because of his humility, is the terror of, is the terror of demons. And yeah. look at that correlation with Our Lady and her humility. But yeah. I think it's important to note to that, that Mary's ability to inspire terror and fear and St. Joseph's comes from God. So ultimately the demons, I would imagine, do fear God more. But yeah. Mary and Joseph are the deputized yeah. executors of yeah. that divine will. They possess that quality. And and we possess that quality as well in virtue of our baptism and our receptivity of grace and our receptivity of God and light as well. Mm -hmm. So to realize that we participate in this battle, church mm -hmm. militants out there, you know, we need to be praying for our priests. We need to be praying for our Not exorcists. Michael Forrest. My <laughs> <laughs> Not that church militant. No, but like the church militant of the laity. Yeah. You know, that that we are that we are a part of a military force as well. And there mm -hmm. is a clear battle between good and evil, and we need to be consumed with good. And being there for each other, supporting each other in this battle is key. Mm -hmm. And we all have different uh charisms as well as different abilities and and talents that in this battle we need. We need operative in the church. Mm -hmm. And one of those things is prayer and our communion with the saints, our communion with Our Lady, our communion with St. Joseph, patron of the universal church. We need this arsenal and we need to be united mystically in, in this battle. Yeah, we did another show on exorcist, um, on exorcism, and we talked about how much uh, demons feared Saint, uh, Pope Benedict mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, you know? right. And JP right. too. Yeah. And that was one of the fear I wanted to mention fear. earlier. Like, um, we don't need to fear the demons at all. Actually, Father Amorth says, if we do, he's winning. The demons are winning when we fear them. And, uh, but that's how, that's one of the ways they work against us. They yeah. make us afraid of them. And I think the last thing that exorcists want you to know speaks to that. And that is that our Lord has absolute authority over demons. Yeah. So out of these seven things, it, it ends on that note. But what does that mean that our Lord has authority over demons? That they are creatures and nothing more. And he is the, the almighty and nothing happens to us that he doesn't permit or cause. So they can't touch us unless he lets them. And even once they do, like if we obey him, if we start to obey him, they're gone. We can have, we can be, we can be terrors of demons. Uh, the same way by, um, there's a neat little document. Um, I think it was one of the old popes, as I call them, um, wrote a document on St. Joseph, and how he shares by the conjugal ties in Our Lady's graces. Not perfect, you know, fullness, plenitude, but that's why he's like number two. Like mm -hmm. Our Lady's the top, he's next, and he's terror of demons, and so is she. I didn't know she was actually called terror of demons, but she is as well, which makes sense that they both that's are. That's what they did on date night. They just went out and beat up <laughs> on beat demons. Up demons. Talk, about, talk about the fullness of grace, but she's got the fullness of names. I mean, it, Our Lady right. has so many names and aspects of devotion, which is do her right. I mean, my goodness gracious. But yeah, I love, I love how many names yeah. Our Lady has. So if we stay, I think you almost use the same wording that uh, on the flight over here, I was just taking some notes, just thinking, and I wrote down the, the power of the, wait, no, the beauty of the power of Christ. And you almost said the exact mm -hmm. same thing earlier. Mm -hmm. Like that's what we're living in, the, the beauty of the power. Like the way he, the way he conquers the demons, the way he, empowers us to conquer demons is beautiful. It's not just this um, 
you know, raw cook. chorus of power. Yeah. There's a beauty mm-hmm. and an elegance to it that is perfect. And right? it's and it's encouraging because God will lead you into contact with your real fear. And yes, fear arises, but when you're encountering that fear, trust all the more enters into a period of submission that you submit even more to Christ and you are placing your trust in his hands to guide you through what you fear. Mm-hmm. And when he does, he comes, it's like you're renewed and you're recreated. And it is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Charles, I really want to thank you for coming here. Oh, this yeah. was absolutely yeah, awesome. Thanks for being on the show. Can I keep episode. this? Are you sure? I, I would copies. love to read this. <laughs> yes. Uh, guys, everyone out there, go out there and get this Slaying Dragons by Charles Franny. Uh, you can go to his website at theslayingdragonsbook.com. I'll put links to this, but this is a... This is an important book, and and I really, really appreciate you writing it, coming mm-hmm. out here and talking to us about it, and sharing this with all of our listeners. Yeah, I really appreciate it. So in order to get those links, you're going to have to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as go to catholictalkshow.com. There you'll be able to see all the ways that you can listen in or view, and most especially a big shout out to our Patreons, and hopefully we'll be setting up a new tier to be able to provide our patrons you know, a chance to get a scapular. Um, in honor of this show and in honor of Our Lady's defense over evil and in to put this relationship book, to if us. If it's okay, I'll try to put this book, and we'll buy a couple copies from you, put this book and the uh, scapular together as a tier. That, sound, that mm-hmm. sounds beautiful. Nice. So if you're interested in becoming a patron, go to patreon.com forward slash Catholic Talk Show, and you'll see ways that you could support us and get access to the book and to the scapular. And again, we want to thank you so much for being here. This was, We were blessed by your presence and the ministry that God has entrusted to you. God bless you. Yeah, thank Thanks, you. Charles. Thank you, Father. And we'll see you next week.